This is a topic that is quite fascinating. How many of you have looked at the history or origins of yoga? Can you raise your hands? A few of you? OK. So yoga has an immensely fascinating and interesting history. In studying this area, I found myself alternately spellbound, fascinated, shocked, and respectful of the various incarnations that yoga has um, taken throughout the centuries. One of the classes that I teach at the University of Virginia is called Foundations of Medical Yoga for Health Professionals. And in that class, we took a really good long look at the history and origins of yoga. And from that perspective, we really looked at cultural impact, um, religious impact, societal impact, and the ways that yoga has been accepted as, and also rejected throughout history. Many, many different traditions, religions, cultures, cults, schools, secret sects have embraced different aspects of yoga and the yoga teachings from its inception to contemporary times. As well, over the centuries, different scholars and saints and sages, educators, healthcare workers, researchers, politicians, hippies, and everybody else that you can think of have embraced yoga in various different forms. And as you all know, in contemporary times, yoga has woven deep, been woven deeply into the fabric of our current culture and society. However, I will say that in the beginning, yoga emerged more as a theological and philosophical and religious practice, much more than what we see today, where it's predominantly uh, an asana practice and various other practices. But really, currently, it's dominant in the asana arena. So the history of yoga provides us really with just an absolutely fascinating glimpse into the yoga practices and the way that it has impacted, again, culturally, morally, spiritually, and so on. In our contemporary times, what I find kind of interesting is that when someone finds out that you practice yoga, they put you pretty much immediately into a little box in their mind that says that you are somebody that typically would have a little bit of a higher moral and ethical standard. And someone, I think, who they in their mind think, well, of course, you can be trusted. So there's a sense of people who practice yoga have a certain reputation, in a way. However, that has not always been the case. There was a time in history when yogis were considered fighters, filthy, dirty, and lower class. And these individuals were not welcomed into society, nor were they embraced by various different religious cultures and practices during specific times. So even though in religious circles and in various societies, yoga has taken different twist and, twists and turns, the real essence of yoga has never really been violated in any way, that, that the path of yoga that leads toward enlightenment and self-realization self -realization has remained pure over the centuries. However, in contemporary times, what we find is that we've been given a set of formulas, practices, principles that assist us in navigating sometimes a difficult life path. So there's two pieces of how we practice yoga today. One is, how do we navigate difficult pa a pa difficult path? And the second is, what is the path to enlightenment and self-realization? So this evening, I'm going to take you through a very brief overview of ancient yoga all the way to contemporary times and how yoga has fractured even in contemporary times. So, I am going to also provide you with a caveat that 
there are many, many, many contemporary people who have influenced the spread of yoga across our planet into healthcare and research and many other areas. But because the topic is so, so broad, I'm really not gonna be able to hit all of the people who have been very influential in, in the spread of yoga. So given that, I just wanna say I honor them and I respect their contribution, but we just don't have time to cover absolutely everybody. So, okay. Can one of you come and help with the slide thing, please? Oh, okay, great. I think I have it. All right, so I'm going to start, and again, I, this is going to be just a really brief overview. Um, yoga, as many of you know, comes from a very diverse and very multifaceted path. The first glimpse that we get I don't think this is working. Oh, okay. The first glimpse that we get of yoga is uh, in the pre-Vedic age, uh, 6500 to about 4500 BC, and that was with the Indus Valley civilization. What? <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> except my slide is contingent upon what I'm gonna say. Basically, the Indus Valley, there we go, it moved. Oh, you did it, oh, thank you. <laughs> All right, well, in the Indus Valley civilization, very little is known, thank you, very little is known about this civilization. Um, there is writings on yoga, but it was a means toward enlightenment. Also, some scholars believe that Ayurvedic medicine also originated during this time. And this civilization mysteriously disappeared. They have no understanding of why or what happened, but it mysterious, mysteriously did disappear. We move then into the Vedic era, 1500 to about 1000 BC, and there's a lot of evidence of yoga during this period of time. Um, and ancient texts, some of you, most of you are probably very familiar with the Vedas. These are the oldest writings in existence and the most sacred books of Hinduism. Veda means knowledge or sacred lore. So yoga in the Vedas focused on the investigation of the relationship between the universe, nature, God, and humans. Again, mostly just philosophical and religious exploration. And most of the writings evolve around hymns, rituals, theologies, and philosophies. And during the Vedic period, Ayurvedic medicine was significantly developed. And for those of you who don't know, Ayurvedic medicine is a sister science to yoga. So I'm gonna just give you a very brief little introduction to Ayurvedic medicine and yoga. Both of them have parallel philosophy, the same lineages, shared treatment options, similar theory of disease and illness, and Ayurveda embraces yoga as a main treatment option. Uh, Ayu means life and Veda means knowledge. And Ayurvedic medicine is one of the oldest systems of medicine in the world. For contemporary Ayurvedic medicine, it's still widely practiced in India and worldwide. Baba Hari Das, who is a monk and Ayurvedic practitioner, brought Ayurveda to the US in the early 70s. And there was such a high interest that eventually uh, the whole Mount Madada Institute uh, was developed with a college of Ayurveda, a spa, pharmacy, and research center. And in the 80s, Maharish Mahesh Yogi also founded the Maharishi Vedic Approach to Health Clinic. The Himalayan Institute was also involved with clinics related to Ayurvedic medicine. In the 90s, Deepak Chopra is credited for bringing Ayurveda more into mainstream healthcare. Um, and he became the executive director of Sharp Healthcare Center as well. He co founded the uh, Chopra uh, Center for Well Being. So that's just a little diversion, a little overview on Ayurvedic medicine. So now we're going to go back to the lineage of yoga. Um, from the Vedic period, we move into the pre, what's considered the pre-classic era, and this is 500 to about 200 BC. It's a period where yoga was systematized and more cohesion uh, became known in terms of yoga. 
So it was much more coherent philosophical system of yoga began to emerge. Uh, schools of Buddhism, Hinduism, and, and Jainism em emerged. These writings, teachings, and philosophies, again, were systematized and, corp and incorporated philosophical aspects of yoga. This is also the era that Patanjali systematized the Yoga Sutras. So I'm gonna to talk to you just briefly about the Yoga Sutras. What Patanjali did, he did not develop anything new. What he did is he took pre-existing philosophical beliefs and traditional practices of yoga, and he systematized them into a text called the Yoga Sutras. The Yoga Sutras are 196 aphorisms, and they became one of the authoritative texts on yoga. And eventually, the sutras were reified into one of the six schools of classic Indian philosophy. Part of Patanjali's Yoga Sutras emerged uh, the Eight Limb Path, Ashtanga Yoga, which is what most all of us practice today. Um, it is the foundation of contemporary yoga practices in terms of guidance, enlightenment, healing, and many other things. So, the yamas and niyamas as part of the eight limb path are the ethical and behavioral guidelines of what we subscribe to. And then we've got the asanas, pranayama, and then prachahara at the very bottom. And the other four steps are more the mind practices and sort of a path to enlightenment. So the Yoga Sutras, I found this really interesting. The Yoga Sutras, uh, there were major commentaries that were written between the 9th and the 16th century. But by the 12th century, the Yoga Sutras were starting to decline. Interest in them were starting to decline. And literally by the 16th century, Patanjali's yoga philosophy virtually had become extinct. It was not in vogue, it was not of interest to any of the theologies or philosophical schools. However, it was brought back to popularity in the 19th century by Swami Vivekananda um, when he regarded the Yoga Sutras as the science of yoga and the, quote, supreme contemplative path to self-realization. So, what about the asanas? Not at all like we have today. So Patanjali discusses asanas in the Yoga Sutras, but only in, I think, in about maybe five of the sutras. And the emphasis that he places on the asanas are that which is steady and pleasant, and motionless form is asana. So it doesn't look anything like it does in contemporary times. So then we move into... Um, the Mahabharata and the Bhagavad Gita, which in that same era, about 500 BC to about 200 BC is when these writings and such emerged. So the Mahabharata defines the purpose of yoga as uniting the individual Atman with the universal all-pervading Brahman. It's an epic of about 100,000 stanzas of verse divided into 18 books. It was, it was authored by Vyasa in the ancient language of Sanskrit, and it was handed down originally in the oral tradition. It's literally today it's the largest single literary work in existence. So it's just a massive piece of um, work. Uh, the Bhagavad Gita is part of the Mahabharata, and it consists of, about, consists of about 700 verses. It covers the laws and rules of yoga practice that focus on enlightenment. So we're still in this era where the focus of yoga is philosophical, enlightenment, um, mostly spiritual practice, meditative type of practices. But the Bhagavad Gita is a story narrate, narrated by a dialogue between Lord Krishna and Arjuna, who represents the human. And how do we navigate the mind is, is a lot about what the dialogue is, it consists of. Uh, the Bhagavad Gita also introduces three prominent types of yoga that had not been very emphasized previously, and that's karma yoga, bhakti yoga, and jnana yoga, right action, devotion, and knowledge. So it wasn't until the Middle Ages, about 500 to 1500 CE, where we see the emergence of hatha yoga. And in this emergence, there are three classical texts of Hatha Yoga. One is the Hatha Yoga Pratipika, the Shiva Samhita, and the Garanda Samhita. 
So I'm going to just take a minute and share a little about what these three texts entail and what it covers. Because um, many people are very interested. They don't know so much about the other two texts, but the Pratapika is a, very, a fairly popular text in yoga tradition today. This text was composed by Swat, Swat Marama, and it included a compilation of a lot of their earlier texts and, and teachings about Hatha yoga. But mostly it focuses on physical purification um, related to the postures and breathing techniques that a person would need to do in order to achieve an enlightenment. It also elaborates quite a bit on the chakras, the nadis, the bandhas, the mudras, things like that. So the nadis are energy channels, uh, the chakras are energy centers in the body, bandhas are locks, and mudras are gestures. And these all are practiced in contemporary times as part of learning how to steady the mind and move the, the mind toward deep, deep levels of stillness leading toward enlightenment. So the Hatha Yoga Pratipika outlines 84 asanas. However, other scholars believe that there were only 16 postures that were proposed and four of which were seated. So we're not looking into any of the postures or asana or yoga practices that we see in contemporary times yet. The Shiva Samhita was, they don't know the exact origin of that. They are speculating between the 13th and 17th century. The author is unknown. And it, same thing, focuses on the idea there is one eternal truth and path to self-realization. And there's various chapters to it that address how to awaken the Kundalini and purify the self. It does name 40, or I'm sorry, 84 different asanas, but only four of which are described in detail. And then we move into the uh, Garanda Samhita. And again, they're not 100% sure when this text, text uh, um, originated, uh, but they speculate the 17th century. And the author is unknown. What I find really interesting about this is that the Garand Garanda means vessel. Uh, and they're looking at the, the human body as a vessel. And it's a, it's a text that provides a step-by-step -step manual that focuses on practices done to purify the body and mind for the realization of the soul. It's very clear step-by-step -step practices. And it does detail 32 asanas for building body strength and uh, purif um, also practices for purification and things like that. So then we move into about the 15th to 19th century, and this is the era of the fighting yogis. Very fascinating era, uh, twists and turns of, of yoga practice. During this era, Hatha yoga was promoted and used for military purposes, prowess, and strength. There were literally bands of wandering, militarized yogis who controlled the trade routes across northern India. The uh, yoga did not have a very good name at that point in history. Uh, I had a very negative impact on British commerce and just yoga in general. What happened finally is that the British government banned wandering and militarized yogis. And they were literally forced to settle in urban areas and they had to resort to yogic showmanship and spectacle to basically earn money, but they were panhandlers at that time, and they had a very, very bad reputation. So you see various pictures of cities and things like that that the yogis demonstrated to earn money, but again, they were all corralled into urban areas. They were no longer allowed to wander about, and they definitely were demilitarized. So the Hatha yoga practices in general became associated with the homeless and the poor. Asana practice considered, were considered by the British and higher class Indians as inferior to worthier practices of yoga. And these yogis were labeled as disturbing and disgraceful. Um, the British pushed very hard for more acceptable religious and yoga practices among the Indians. And that really was all about meditative Hinduism. So the spread of yoga also happened quite extensively during this time, and we see that it moved into Zen Buddhism, Sikhism, Jainism, and but again, the emphasis was on meditational practices and somewhat on purification practices, but for some sects, it had gone too far in terms of the um, 
purification practices. So it was fracturing a lot during this era with different uh, religions and spiritual groups embracing what their beliefs were in terms of yoga practices. So then we see yoga starting to merge westward in the 19th and 20th century. In 1851, uh, N.C. Paul published his Treatise on Yoga Philosophy, and this is when yoga became a little bit more known in Western circles. In the 1890s, this was a very seminal moment when Swami Vivekananda toured Europe and the U.S. He was the first Hindu teacher to disseminate aspects of yoga to Western audiences, but again the emphasis was only on the philosophical and meditative aspects of yoga. The New England transcendentalists and intellectuals, um, such as the Ralph Waldo Emerson followers, very enthusiastically embrace the teachings of Swami Vivekananda. So then we see the spread of yoga philosophy and meditational concepts through those particular avenues also. So the, some defining events to continue. In 1905, um, Bernard was an American yogi who traveled to India, and upon return, he founded the Tantric Order of America. So again, we're seeing more spread of yoga um, through different avenues. In the 1920s, I think most of you have heard of Paramana Paramahansa Yogananda. Yes, how many of you have heard of, of him? Probably most people. Um, he started the Self-Realization Fellowship, and his best-selling book, Autobiography of a Yogi, literally inspired an entire generation of yogis. And, for, and I can attest to that because I'm one of them. The first exposure that I had to yoga was Autobiography of a Yogi back in 1971. In 1928, we also see Western medical researchers starting to visit India, looking at different um, research and health centers, and just exploring yoga as a science. So the cultural and political influences in the late 18th and early 19th century, this is very interesting, by the way, the British pursued policies of conciliation toward the native culture of India. Years of colonial rule resulted in racism that implied Indians were physically and racially inferior to whites, and reappropriating Hatha yoga became a larger product of Indian nationalism. And the construction of the new, quote, Indian man was designed <clears throat> to combat these stereotypes. What's very interesting and fascinating about this is this coincided with the, what was known as the physical physical culture era. So what happened is during that time, fitness and exercise reg regimes known as physical culture were very popular in the West. All, it was spreading like wildfire all over Europe and also into America. And due to this phenomena, the British influence of physical culture then also became popular in India. And physical culture was based on bodybuilding practices, gymnastics, and military calisthenics. So what we see, and this is, I think, a very, very seminal point in terms of the history and lineage of yoga, because what we see here is it intersects with culture, cultural and societal phenomena in the sense that traditional Hatha, yogas, Hatha yoga practices were combined with modern physical culture. In, attempt, in an attempt to meld indigenous Indian exercises with more Western practices and ideals. So we have to pause here for a moment, because that is a seminal moment in history. The new, more aerobic and acrobatic version of yoga was formatted, formatted that was devoid of any of the negati negative military associations and showmanship of earlier centuries. But guess what that did to yoga? Here we go. Krishnamacharya was a highly, highly influential person in the development of modern yoga. He was deeply embedded in physical culture, as was his financial backer, the Maharaja Mysore, big, huge physical cultural in, culture enthusiast. As a result, a new blend of yoga was developed that included bodybuilding, gymnastics, military calisthenics, and specific Hatha yoga practices that were only deemed acceptable. 
So the new physically oriented acrobatic form of yoga, yoga is what migrated to the West. And some of these styles of yoga were devoid of any spiritual or meditative practices, not all of them, but many of them. This new form of yoga was taught to some of the most influential global yoga teachers, uh, teachers of the 20th century. Iyengar, Patabi Joy, the founder of Ashtanga Yoga, Desikachar, the founder of Vinaya Yoga, and Indra Devi, um, who brought a lot of Hatha Yoga to the Beverly Hills, California, LA uh, group. So these are pictures of Iyengar, Patabi Joy, and Desikachar and Indra Devi, and uh, actually Indra Devi came here to the ashram, I think probably about 30 years ago, and stayed for a short period of time. It was delightful to have her here, very knowledgeable woman. So some of the poses or sequences that we think of today as foundational to yoga were really only invented in the 1930s. Uh, an example of that is the sun salutation. That's a venerated yoga sequence, but it was invented in the 1930s, and it had more in common with military calisthenics and gymnastics than with yoga. And this is also really interesting, that the use of Sanskrit to define some of the poses was intentional, to make them seem more like a part of cultural tradition, the cultural tradition of yoga. And the idea that contemporary poses are part of a thousand-year-old tradition is only partially accurate. So then yoga moves into the 1960s and 70s. Yoga at that point was considered a fad. Um, practice and interests mostly focused on enlightenment, expanding consciousness, out-of-body experiences, altered states of consciousness, LSD experiments, meditation, relaxation. That's where I got exposed to yoga. How many of you were in that? <laughs> were in that group of hippies that were practicing yoga? Jeevas back there. Probably many of the swamis here and others here came from this particular um, exposure to yoga. So Master Shivananda is another titan who uh, left a huge legacy worldwide, but also to the West. Uh, Master Shivananda, who's the person over there above that altar, um, he was a medical doc doctor, and he was the founder of the Divine Life Society. And global teachers from his lineages are... Of course, Swami Satchidananda, who founded the Integral Yoga Institutes and the ashrams worldwide. And Sri Gurudev's legacy, this is my opinion, is he greatly, greatly, greatly influenced the spread of therapeutic and medical yoga and promoted interfaith movement and worldwide influence on teacher training programs. So, uh, and also Vishnu Devananda. Uh, was another uh, global influence on yoga as part of the Master Shivananda lineage. And he founded the Shivananda ashrams worldwide, wrote the complete illustrated book of yoga. Swami Shivananda Radha was also an influence, but mostly in Canada, and she founded the uh, Yashodhara ashram. So other influences of yoga to the West, and again, please forgive me, I know there are many, many influences. This just is highlighting a few. Richard Hittleman uh, in the 60s and 70s, very, very influential, and he started the groundbreaking TV series Yoga for Health. Yogi Bhajan, um, I, is that your um, teacher? Yes, I figured as, su as such, uh, founded the 3HO movement and brought Kundalini Yoga to the United States and I think also worldwide. Swami Muktananda came to the U.S. in the 70s, founder of Siddha Yoga. Swami Rama arrived in the 70s, uh, founder of the Himalayan Institute of Yoga Science and also participated in research with Dr. Green with the Menninger Foundation, Richard Alpert, uh, 60s and 70s, consciousness teacher, uh, charitable organizations are the uh, Seva or, uh, Foundation and the Hunnaman Foundation, and probably many of you remember his book, Be Here Now, a massive global influence. Um, and Baba Hari Das uh, came to the U.S. in the 70s. He's the one that founded the Mount Madonna Center and the Ayurvedic School and so on. 
So during this time, and we're still in the 60s and 70s, ashrams, communes, intentional communities became more prolific in the West, as well as pilgrimage to in, pilgrimages to India to find enlightenment. There were huge, huge cultural shifts during this time in music, rock and roll, dress standards, feminism, women's lib, civil rights, the peace movement, all of that intersected with yoga and yoga practices. People were looking for something different, people were looking for enlightenment, and they wanted to go about it either through LSD and drugs, or through yoga and meditation, or whatever they were doing. Um, this was a time of anti-establishment and anti-war sentiments. It became rampant, again, along with social activism, protests, and the hippie movement. And again, yoga was part of that counterculture. At the same time that all of this was happening, there were academic and research circles who began to explore the concepts of type A personality, stress management, biofeedback, relaxation, the effects of meditation. In the 60s and 70s is when Barbara Brown, who I'll get to in a minute, um, she's credited for being the founder of biofeedback and working with the whole relaxation concept. Dr. Herbert Benson, hugely influential in this arena uh, with his best-selling book, The Relaxation uh, Response, and that impacted tremendously into academia and the general public both. So let's move into the 80s and 90s in terms of what is called the modern yoga era. So in the 80s, before that, yoga was considered a fad. Then we move into the 80s, and yoga, mindfulness, and meditation literally exploded into Western consciousness, rapidly moved into mainstream, and prolific teacher training programs in medical yoga and therapeutic yoga started to emerge during this time. So the 80s are considered what is called a second yoga boom occurred. And there was this second generation of teachers and researchers that emerged um, from all of these people ha who had come to the West, Yogi Bhajan, Swami Rama, uh, Vishnu Devananda, uh, Baba Haridas, and all of those teachers. Now we're moving into the second generation. And the second generation of yogis helped usher yoga into the mainstream. And they implemented yoga into healthcare, education, academia, research, hospitals, and insurance reimbursement. Um, and what's interesting also is at this time, medical and therapeutic yoga was established as a separate discipline from the public and general use of yoga. So the therapeutic and medical yoga teacher training programs, again, became very prolific, evidence-based certification courses and training programs in mindfulness and yoga therapy. Literally, it was like a tsunami. There was a revolution that occurred, and we're still in it, which is quite exciting and interesting. So we've got yoga for everything, yoga for thyroid, high blood pressure, snoring, um, menstrual problems, pregnancy, diabetes, I mean, everything you can think of, yoga has merged into all of these arenas. Uh, cardiac medical yoga, MS, pre and postnatal, special child trauma, mood states, cancer, restorative, gentle, hospital, but, and so, I mean, the list is endless where yoga has merged into and the creative uh, innovations that people are involved in related to yoga. There's a few pioneers who were influential. As I mentioned, Barbara Brown was the founder of the concept of biofeedback, John Kabat-Zinn, founder of the mindfulness-based stress reduction programs, Richard Davidson. Uh, he's a Harvard grad that um, started a clinic at UW-Madison, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, does 30 years worth of stellar research in the area of neuroscience, yoga, mind states, mindfulness, and so on. And he's the one that brought the Dalai Lama over, and they began having talks around the whole idea of what's going on in the mind of the meditator. And of course, Dr. Dean Orner, researcher on reversing and preventing coronary heart disease using a yoga-based model. So Dean is actually a student of Swami Satchidananda as part of our um, organization. And he, I think, in a very singular manner, thrust yoga into the forefront of tre medical treatment options with his groundbreaking research in using yoga to reverse heart disease. 
And because of his research, in 2010, the US government authorized reimbursement for the Ornish program for reversing heart disease through Medicare and Medicaid. Phenomenal steps. Um, that we're seeing here. And then several major insurance companies also purchased the Ornish program and began reimbursing for therapeutic yoga. So we are seeing a phenomena, a revolution, um, a tsunami of where yoga has come from and where we're taking it today. So we see different headlines like this. And we also see the expansion of yoga through the Yoga Journal, which was established in 1975, the International Association of Yoga Therapy in 89, and the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine, which became a national center in 1993. So in, as far as the IAYT, I'm just gonna go over this really quickly because I just have a few more minutes. Um, this is the, the progress of IAYT to the point now where we're at, uh, we, they have an 800 hour certification program through 24 certified schools. Yoga therapy, uh, or I'm sorry, the IAYT certified, certified over 500 IAYT members and credentialed them as yoga therapists. And they have put together a code of ethics and a scope of practice and so on. So yoga in the 21st century, since 2001, the popularity of yoga has exploded from 4 million in 2001 to over 36 million in 2016. And it draws support from world leaders like President Obama, who completely supports the concept of yoga. Um, and yoga also has merged into healthcare in a tremendous way. And I just want to take a minute and talk to you about this because if you're interested at all, definitely look up this organization. The Bravewell Collaborative is a community of leading philanthropists who work together to transform the US healthcare system and improve the health of, American, of the American public through the advancement of integrative medicine, of which yoga is a very prominent part. And the theme of their organization is, it's a movement whose time has come. So it's very, very interesting. Many different hospitals have purchased the Bravewell uh, program, clinical program, and are implementing yoga-based programs and mindfulness-based mindfulness programs within their hospital settings. Whoops, let's go back here. Uh, healthcare workers, uh, yoga and mindfulness have extended beyond the patient, just patient care into compassionate care and resiliency interventions for healthcare workers. Hospital systems and academia are embracing yoga and mindfulness strategies for dealing with compassion, fatigue, and burnout. And research over $100 million just through NIH, and that's just one organization, have been spent on studies related to research in mindfulness and yoga practice practices um, from everything from lower back pain to reversing heart disease, impacting on cancer, reducing heart and blood pressure, relieving anxiety, depression, and so on. So many different professional organizations have been created. Um, Healthways, Lifestyle Medicine Association, Integrative Health Policy Consortium, and so on. Yoga has moved into commercials. It's not surprising or you know shocking anymore to see yoga in commercials. And we also have what is called now World Yoga Day in January of 2016. It was established by the Prime Minister Modi of India to be held on the solstice January 21st of each year. And in June 20. And in, and in 2016, more than a billion people across our planet participated in yoga, World Yoga Day throughout 192 countries. Pretty phenomenal stuff. So these are some pictures from World Yoga Day. So the bottom line, yoga has arrived and I don't think it's going away. <laughs> so that's just a little brief overview of the process of yoga, where it's come from, and where we are with it today. So I think it's quite, quite fascinating that um, how it is um, fractured into so many different areas, into academia and research and ashrams and, and all of that. So so great to have all of you here spreading the practices of yoga. So thank you so much.